So again, this is Google Tools for All Learners, today's episode of Webinar Wednesday. So welcome to today's webcast. I'm Carla Kuiper. I'm the Director of Technology Integration for East Baton Rouge Parish Schools. And you'll see my contact information on the slide. I'm a Google for Education certified trainer. And I would love it if you would reach out to me after today's webinar to ask me anything um, or to elaborate on any of the points in today's brief and informational webinar. If for any reason you get disconnected during this webcast, the dial-in directions are posted in the slide deck. This is slide three, so you can dial in using your mobile phone or mobile device in case you get disconnected from today's broadcast. This webinar is intended to be one in a series this spring. So today we're looking at all um, empowering all learners in the classroom using Google tools. Last week we looked at ways to use Google Keep for productivity and efficiency. During the next webinar, we're going to take a look at Google Sheets, tips for teachers and school administrators, and then on into March, flipped instruction, and then getting started with Google Data Studio. So <clears throat> today's topic that we're talking about is how can we empower all students in a systematic way, in a way that truly recognizes that all students are different and that we have resources available to us, a rich uh, treasure trove in some cases of resources available to us to help empower all students. And so part of today's discussion will be all about the newly revised Universal Design for Learning Framework. So our agenda and objectives, we're going to talk about UDL, or Universal Design for Learning, what universal design for learning has to do with technology, ways to incorporate using, uh, ways to incorporate universal design, using the tools we have, and then a brief question and answer time. I'll, I'll hang around as long as you would like, and we can talk about the framework. So, Designs for learning, universal designs for learning, equity versus equality. So in the first picture all the way to the left, it's assumed that everybody benefits from the same supports. Um, students are treated equally. And I know that many of us can identify with the first picture. It's very familiar to have spent time in classrooms all throughout our learning years where it was assumed that everyone would benefit from the same supports and the same type of instruction. But when we move along and move into the second image, we know that in many cases, and especially um, in our districts, students often need different supports to make it possible for them to have equal access to, to instruction. And we see this less in terms of equality and more in terms of equity. And moving all the way to the right, in the third image, all three students can see the game without any supports or accommodations because causes of inequity are systematically addressed. And so the barriers are taken down, they're removed, and so all students have access to the game and without a need for accommodations. So what does this have to do with universal design? Well, universal design is built and constructed around three principles. First is engagement, that we create engaging environments and sustain motivation for students and that we remove barriers in the classroom that reduce engagement and motivation. Second, representation, supporting independent access to, to learning materials and remove, access, uh, remove barriers, I should say, to learning materials. And then third, expression, to provide multiple ways to create, learn, and demonstrate understanding. So multiple means of engagement helps our students become more purposeful and more motivated. Multiple means of action and expression helps our students become more strategic and goal-directed. So kind of the how of learning, strategic networks. And then multiple means of representation deals with recognition networks, kind of the what of learning, 
and to help our students ultimately become lifelong learners who are resourceful and knowledgeable. So the entire framework can be found on the Universal Design for Learning CAST website. And you can see it's a comprehensive framework that has many components to it. We won't get into a discussion of each and every checkpoint in each and every part of the framework today, but I wanted to provide this brief and informational webcast to provide you with an introduction or some connections to some of the tools that you're using in your classroom right now. So you can see that the framework covers things like interest, self-regulation, ways to improve student comprehension, um, ways to provide more options for students to improve executive functioning, expression and communication, and so on. So to start off, let's talk about multiple means of engagement. The guiding principle here under universal design is that learners differ very um, markedly sometimes in the ways that they're motivated to learn or the ways that they can be engaged. There's no one means of engagement that works for all learners in all contexts. So what that means is that in many instances to bring all learners in our classroom to the table, we have to give students multiple ways to organize and to self-manage. This helps students to sustain their efforts and also to be persistent, especially when material becomes difficult. So what are some of the tools that we can use? Um, and you'll see on the right side, a few ideas. Google Calendar, allowing students to use Google Calendar within Google Classroom. Google Keep Checklists. The task feature in Google Docs. Um, Chrome extensions that add timers. To, um, to Google Docs and to other, um, to Google Chrome, I should say. And then also to allow students to use self-paced lessons in Nearpod or to put lessons in self-paced mode. So all of these things allow students to self-organize, also to give them options for self-management. And when we do that, that helps to pr um, provide students with the motivation necessary to sustain their efforts, especially in, um, with difficult and challenging concepts. I'm not going to play the entire um, video on the slide, but the video on the slide, there the link, review. and I'll try to play it without any sound, um, will show you how to launch student paced lessons in um, Nearpod. So we all have access to Nearpod. It's a wonderful tool that we have access to. I know it's not, strictly speaking, it's not Google. It integrates wonderfully well with Google and it is a district resource that we have. And it's fairly easy to launch student paced lessons. And like I said, I'll try to launch this and play it for a few seconds without any sound. So you can start to see how you can set up a self-paced lesson. So in the video so far, you may notice that the teacher has launched the Nearpod lesson, launched it in self-paced mode, and Again, this gives the students some voice and some choice over how to go through the slides and can really increase learner motivation. Another set of strategies. Involves allowing students to make personal and cultural connections. This makes learning more relevant to students. And so this is another strategy under universal design for engagement. The tips and strategies that you can use here are to use Google Forms to survey interests, use Google Slides. Um, whenever you have um, students and they have the opportunity to do a Google Doc or to create a presentation, you can use Google Slides. I recommend you allowing students to use the template gallery because the template gallery will take them to 
options that they don't have to start from scratch. So the template gallery can make the task of getting started with a presentation a lot um, more accessible and less frustrating. Another way to allow students to make personal and cultural connections are Nearpot virtual field trips. All right, let me log into Nearpod and I'll show you how easy it is to find the virtual field trips on Nearpod. So I've logged into my Nearpod account. I'm going to explore the Nearpod lesson library. And once inside, you can see there's a ton of things available. I'm going to the filters and I'm going to select um, the virtual reality resources and hit search. Once you do that, you'll see that there's a variety of Nearpod VR resources. And the more you scroll, the more you'll see. These Nearpod virtual reality experiences can be used with um, Google Cardboard or Google Expeditions with VR headsets or just on their own on the Chromebook or computer. So I'll pull up the preview here and you can take a look. You can see that it starts with a teacher's guide to help students and teachers with the resource, including learning objectives. And then you'll see them, eventually you'll see the, the VR resource. So there's a lot here. And you'll also see where you can use these VR resources. So again, I just went into the lesson library, hit the filter, and virtual reality. and then search. Another resource that we have readily available to us are Discovery Education virtual field trips. So we have Discovery Education in the district, and you may not have known that Discovery does virtual field trips, and they do them on a pretty regular basis. So if you go to their um, virtual field trips page, you can check out the events calendar, the virtual field trips that are coming up, and you can also check out archived virtual field trips based on grade level, topics, and subjects. And then of course, if you have access to Google Expeditions, then you probably already know that these can really help students make cultural and personal connections to the things that we're teaching. Under engagement, it's also important to schedule time for collaboration. This helps to facilitate adaptive coping skills in all of our students, especially our students who become emotionally overwhelmed when concepts are challenging or when there's a heavy workload. And it, these, this can also foster collaboration and community. So there are many, many ways to do this. Blogger is one option that's available in our district. Blogger is open at this time. Um, consider having students build a collaborative Google site or using the collab collaboration features in Google Slides and in Google Docs. Moving on to multiple means of representation. The guiding principle here is that learners can differ drastically in the ways that they perceive and comprehend information. There is no one means of representation that's optimal for all learners. So the more channels we open up for representation in our classrooms, the more students we can bring to the table as empowered learners. So 
Underrepresentation, one of the guiding strategies is to provide digital versions of key materials. And this helps to offer alternatives to auditory and print information. So what are some of the ways that we can use the tools that we have available to us in the district to do this? So one way that we know and love already is Google Drive. We can convert images and PDFs to text. Another option that we have are add-ons. One add-on that I like is called Kaizena, and it's an add-on for Google Docs. So you don't need permission to, to use it. You can add it into Google Docs. And Google Docs um, will enable Kaizena, once you have the add-on installed, to provide um, verbal and auditory feedback on Google Docs. So consider using the Kaizena add-on. Also, YouTube captioning is another option that we have. When pulling up YouTube videos, you can add or turn on the captioning features. Kurzweil 3000 is another tool that we have available to us in the district. All of teachers and students have accounts in Kurzweil 3000. If you have questions about gaining access to Kurzweil 3000, please send me an email and I'd be happy to talk to you about gaining access to Kurzweil. It's a wonderful tool. And then also, um, finally, a Chrome extension that reads text out loud, so it provides an alternative to auditory information, is called Announceify. So once installed, Announceify allows uh, students to listen to articles on any website. So again, it just brings our students a little more to the table. It can assist those students who have difficulty, challenges with reading text, especially in a digital format, and can make learning more accessible and students can feel less frustrated. Also under representation, another concept to explore is to allow creation and mindful use of multimedia. So when we allow students to create multimedia, we, we can help them learn to illustrate concepts. So we can add videos to Google Forms, for example. We can allow them to use apps like Video Notes, which is automatically connected to Google Drive. Video Notes allows the teacher to take any video and place it in a window where students can have their notes, can type notes as they watch the video. So the nice part about video notes is that students are watching videos. You're giving them an alternative to, to writing or to receiving information just through um, auditory input, and you're holding them accountable at the same time for comprehension. So video notes, is a great way to provide students an alternative. Another alternative, again, this one is, is not necessarily a Google product, but it is uh, wonderfully integrated with Google, is Edpuzzle. Edpuzzle is pretty cool because it allows you to take any video and it uses a variety of different video channels. YouTube is just one. And it allows you to add formative assessment questions, comprehension questions, multiple choice, open-ended, and a lot more just with this one tool. And I'll speed it up a little bit so you can see this. So students are watching the video, but at the same time, they're being held accountable for paying attention and engaging with the content. Periodically throughout the video, there are formative assessment questions designed to check for comprehension, for understanding, for engagement, scattered throughout the video, and students um, cannot move on in the video until they submit an answer. So Edpuzzle is another tool that I'd love to talk with you about after today's webinar to help you um, allow students to create and mindfully use multimedia.
as a strategy to bring learners to the table in your classroom. In addition to tools like video notes and Edpuzzle, you can also allow students access to materials in other formats. This allows students to access lessons in a different way. For those students who have difficulty or who are challenged, once you've taught a lesson, you can do things such as using existing content on Nearpod. So there are many lessons in the library on Nearpod that you can use as an alternative or as a reteaching tool. You can also use a existing bank of videos from a site like Khan Academy. So it allows students just to hear that information a different way. Or you can create your own content. Um, one website that many teachers are using to create their own content is called Show Me. And it's one of many websites that allows teachers to record themselves providing instruction online. And this in turn allows students to access information in a different format at a different time and possibly even in a different setting. Question seven for the probability quiz. It says Juan had six blue marbles and four red marbles in a bag. He took a marble from the bag and then a second marble without replacing the first one. Assuming a red marble was selected first. So I won't go through the whole video, but you get the idea. On Show Me, you can take existing teaching materials, record a video of yourself, and make that available to your students to access at a later time or in a different setting. Another option that you have is to use the Screencastify Chrome extension. Screencastify is free. You can add it to Chrome very quickly, and it will allow you to record your screen and capture your entire um, desktop, your browser window, um, materials that you're teaching, materials that you have, and you can share these um, links that you get from Screencastify quickly and easily in Google Drive and in Google Classroom. So again, if you like creating your own content, you might decide to go with Screencastify or Show Me. If you're looking for existing content, short on time, go with um, an existing content provider like Khan Academy, or by all means, be sure to check out everything available in the Nearpod District Library. Moving on to multiple means of action and expression, the third principle, the third leg of universal design is all about understanding that our students differ in the ways that they can navigate the learning environment and express the things that they learn and that they know. We try to provide options for action and expression. So how can we do that? What tools do we have in G Suite or around our district to give students more options for expression and communication? One thing we can do is to make voice typing an option for our students. So voice typing is now available in Kurzweil 3000. It's a new feature that's just been launched. And again, Kurzweil 3000 is a literacy support for our students. All teachers and students have access. Kurzweil 3000 allows you to take files from your Google Drive and to deliver them to students with supports available to um, help them to comprehend the text. It can also allow students to annotate texts as well. So if you don't have access to Kurzweil, I'd love to talk with you about that after the webinar and help you get access to this tool that allows the students to do things like bookmark, highlight, create notes, and a lot more. This resource is available, again, 
to everyone in the district. And it's designed to bring students to the table in your classroom. Another option you have is voice typing in Google Docs. It's pretty easy to open up a Google Doc and enable voice typing. Um, and two more options that you can provide for students is to use the Chromebox feature in Chromebooks or the Chromebox Chrome extension. And the Chromebox a Chrome extension helps you to vary the methods for response and navigation. And it's a way to allow students to express themselves and communicate in different ways. Signed, Professor Hero. The professor sends the email. Jacobs and Rigobert Hernandez. In a library, Laura Ann opens her Chromebook, slips on headphones, types Control-Alt-Z, and signs into her account. She reads the email, taps arrow keys to open Google Docs, and begins typing. The American Revolution. An open book, sunglasses, and a computer case lie on the table next to her. In a lecture hall, a TA works at his Chromebook. He opens a shared document, The American Revolution. He reads, then adds a comment at the end. It appears under the screen name, Rigoberto Hernandez, 1979. Great job! Back to Laura, now wearing dark glasses as she works at her Chromebook. In a Google Talk window, a chat message from Rigoberto reads, Hi Laura, just read your paper and left you feedback. Great job! Laura smiles, then types, thanks. In his office, Professor Hero opens a Google spreadsheet, adding an A to columns of grades. Laura packs up her Chromebook and ascends a flight of stairs, waving a white cane in front of her. A logo, Chrome. A web address, ChromeVox.com. All right, so in that YouTube video, you can see that Chromebox is a feature that's built in both of the Chromebooks, and it can also be built into the Chrome browser itself. So it's another way just to open the door for more of our students. So when we vary methods for response and also ways for students to navigate, we empower our learners um, and we also give them ways to be successful. Also, consider providing alternatives to writing as another means to bring more of our students to the table and to empower more learners. So how do we do that? We provide increased access to tools including tools such as Google Drawings, which is accessible through Google Drive, the Draw It feature of Nearpod, um, tools like Powtoons, and also to tools such as Storyboard That. We can also allow students to use and create frameworks. Um, the, uh, Rationale behind using frameworks, things like mind mapping, graphic organizers, and visual thinking strategies is that this helps students to break up complicated ideas and to break those ideas into chunks that they can understand a lot more easily. So there are many, many graphic organizers designed for Google Docs, and I'm just going to share a few um, links here. One is from Eric Kurtz. He's a Google certified trainer, and he likes to share a lot of resources on his website. There are 30 gra graphic organizers that are all created in Google Drawing on his web page. Another or set of organizers is being shared by a school district in Canada, the Black Gold Regional School Division. If you like these documents that you see on this particular website, all you need to do is to click and make a copy and use these in your Google Classroom with students. Another resource comes from a couple of other Google certified trainers who are out there who love to share, uh, Robin Oldfather and Nancy Watson. They have a handout for a presentation that they do called Tech Tools You Didn't Even Know to Ask For. And if you click on the handout image, it'll help you to make a copy of a note-taking page. with a bunch more resources that are sorted around the three different guiding principles of universal design for learning. So representation, 
action and expression. And you'll see some of them are related to Google and others cover other tools. Multiple means of engagement. So Nearpod, uh, Chrome extensions, Flipgrid, Equatio for action and expression. So at this point, we're into Q&A time. Tell me what you think. Use the chat box, or if you would like to, unmute and tell the group about a tool that you feel illustrates one or more of the principles of universal design for learning. Hey, did I leave something out? Tell me about it right now, or share a link to a resource in the chat box right now that we can all check out. All right, welcome. This is question and answer time. And during this time, I'm going to sit back and give you an opportunity to um, go into the chat box or unmute if you're not joining us on the web and tell us about a tool that your students use successfully or that you find empowers our learners in your classroom. Okay, um, Edpuzzle, uh, a suggestion. I love Edpuzzle too because it allows you to take advantage of the use of video, but students have to be engaged. They also have to monitor their comprehension, so they have to regulate themselves and pay attention. And um, so I think Edpuzzle, I agree, it's an excellent resource if you are looking for ways to engage all learners um, through means and methods other than print.
All right. Again, I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts, if you have any questions about the materials presented in today's webinar, all about universal design. If you want to keep this conversation going, by all means, uh, reach out after today's webinar. And I want to close today just by mentioning that universal design for learning is not a technology framework and with good reason. All of the strategies that you'll see on the universal design website can be implemented with no technology or in a low tech environment if needed. The thing that technology brings to the table in terms of universal design for learning is that it simply makes things possible that a few years ago we might not have been able to do. So with that, I thank you for joining in today. And again, I will stay around if you have any questions, any comments, any thoughts. Um, again, this is one webinar in a series and next week I'll be talking about Google Sheets. So thank you for joining in. On our um, ending slides, you'll see the links to our team's website. You can check us out at ebrschoolsedtech.org. There's a lot of information there, including information about upcoming events, webinars, and more. You can check out our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is where our recording of today's and other webinars done by our team. And you can keep this conversation going on Twitter. Check us out. We are at edtechebr. Or reach out to me directly, kkuiper11, at ebrschools.org if you have questions about any of the tools that you saw today.